to God be the glory. I want you to take the last seven days of your life, no matter what your profession is or if you're retired, no matter uh, if you're an introvert or an extrovert, and I would like for you to try to think about your life apart from people. You know, everything that you do, some way, directly or indirectly, revolves around people. You know, sometimes they use the phrase that he or she is a people person. But really, if we're trying to follow Christ, all of us are called to be people, people. When we look at the great example of Jesus, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 21, For even hereunto were you called, that like as Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Not only is that true when it comes to his being faithful and suffering, but when Jesus is demonstrated for us in the Gospels, he is shown to be a people person. He wants us to be people, people too. Will you go with us to Luke chapter 17 as we see Jesus, the people person, and see how we can be like him in focusing on people too? Many people have wondered, what kind of person was Jesus and how would it have been to live at the time when Jesus did? What things would have interest him? What things would have been amusing to him? What would have been his major emphasis? When you open up your Bible to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one of the things that becomes readily apparent is that Jesus was a people person. His interactions with people and the things that influenced him the most were his relationships with other individuals. Neil, when we think about Jesus, one of the things that continues to rise to the surface, doesn't matter where a person was from or the things that they had done, Jesus was interested in people, wasn't he? That's right. You know, when you think about his very mission, the reason he came to this earth was because of people. He gave his life for people. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he rose for people. So everything centered yeah. around him. And no matter what our mission or our purpose is, or even our destiny, it's hard for any of us to think about our life apart from the people aspect. And even though we live in a world that's much more technology driven that may drive us into isolation, God has meant for us from the very beginning of time to have some other people in our lives. He said to, about Adam, it's not good for man to be alone. And so when we're looking at Jesus, Jesus is saying, look, look at my life and see how I interacted with people and see how I want you to do the same in your life. That's right, I guess we could look at any of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and see Jesus' interaction with people. But let's just anchor down in the book of Luke primarily and notice some of the things that Jesus does with people and some of the types of people that Jesus finds himself around and try to draw some lessons from there. Yeah, just taking an inspired slice of scripture somewhat randomly, you just can't go very far before you see Jesus in a variety of situations that revolves around people. So if we look in Luke, I think maybe the first place for us to go is Luke chapter 17 and look in verse 11 and start there and to read, if you don't mind, why don't you read that all the way down uh, to verse 19, Luke 17, 11 through 19. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. And then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And now he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Okay, this is one of those accounts that a lot of people have some familiarity with when we think about what's taking place here in Luke chapter 17, verse 19, 11 through 19. Christ enters into this area. He encounters this man. They have a problem. There's, there's a sickness that they have. And Jesus reaches out and he heals them. And we remember that, of course, nine forget him. And there's one that comes back and says, thank you. But what stands out to us about this text is that Jesus 
had a care and concern for sick people. You think about lepers and their situation as the Old Testament describes it in books like Leviticus and chapters 13 and 14, they would have been social outcasts, right? They would have been people not welcomed in the community. They were commanded according to the law of Moses to cover their mouths and yell out unclean so that people would stay away from them. But Jesus finds himself around sick people and what does he do? He helps them. That's right. And so when we think about how he's our example we want to follow in his steps, when we see how Jesus interacted and treated sick people, I think what he wants us to do is to look at that and to see how we can benefit from his example as we minister to people who are sick. And the first thing that I think we see, as you alluded to, is, is that sick people are people who are often going to find themselves isolated. It may be because they're contagious, it may be because they have some chronic problem, but they find themselves all alone. And compassion is going to drive us, like it does Jesus, to reach out and to minister to people who are sick. We remind ourselves they may not have anybody in their lives besides us to go and help them. You read the Gospels and you find people. You find the man at the Pool of Siloam and he didn't have anybody to put him in when the water was stirred up. There's just all sorts of instances when sick people or people facing various physical handicaps, they were isolated, they were alone, and yet Jesus was drawn to them and sets an example for us to do the same thing. What else does Jesus teach us about our interaction with the sick? Well, he says to us through his example that the sick are to be paid attention to regardless of how they respond. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus knows all things, and he knows that nine are not going to respond. If, if, if that wasn't the example for us, he might have just healed that Samaritan, knowing those other nine weren't going to do that. But what Jesus shows us is, I'm going to, to take care of and minister to sick people, whether they are grateful, whether they acknowledge it, whether they ever say anything or post it on Facebook hmm. or call and tell their, their friends that I did it or not, because they need that to be done for them because of the condition they're in. Kind of reminds me of a passage, though not in the same context, Acts 20 and verse 35. It's more blessed to give mm -hmm. than to receive. The blessing is in the giving. It is in the ministering. It is in the serving. Whether or not we get back a thank you or we get any praise or accolades from men, and that's what Jesus does here. Jesus still did a good deed for these nine, whether or not they ever acknowledged it, and we shouldn't let that be our motivation for why we do it or why we fail to do it. That's right. And, and what can encourage us is found right here at the end of this story is while it can be a thankless business, it seems to me experience bears this out that there are always going to be people who are grateful for our efforts. That's not why we do it, but there are going to be people who appreciate genuinely that an effort was made on their behalf. Even Jesus, though 90% didn't, had someone who said thank you to him. And what Jesus does that we need to learn to do is he focuses on the one and not on the nine. Jesus focuses on the positive and there'll always be people that appreciate what we do and will highlight us. You think about Paul in Philippians chapter two, he says, Epaphroditus ministered to my needs on your behalf. Or in 2 Timothy chapter four, only Luke is with me, but you could say at least Luke is with them. And so Paul acknowledges people that came to his aid and there'll always be people that appreciate it. When we do it, it may not be where everybody we've helped comes along and acknowledges that they've been blessed by our service Service, but in the end, one person's thanks is enough. I think we can both say this from experience, and anybody who ever does this will say this, that when they go and encourage somebody who's sick, they want to help them, but they always come away from that experience feeling more blessed as a result of that. And you just know that that's how God has made us. So when we go to the sick, it's going to be a fruitful work whatever happens, because we're accomplishing the will of God, but there's also a sense of fulfillment that comes in that. I think about the disciples coming back from the limited commission and they come back rejoicing, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They had gone out and ministered to other people, cast out demons, healed the sick. Jesus told them, Matthew 10 and verse eight, freely you've received, freely give to other people. And they come back excited and that's what service does, not for glamor, not for the praise of men, but we know by nature of the way that God's made us, it's a blessing to relieve the burdens of others or to come alongside others as they bear their burden. And so Jesus was a people person. He found himself around the sick and we need to find ourselves in that same group. That's right. You know, that's just on, on, on a day in the life of Christ as he's going about doing his business. He sees sick people and he gives us that example. Now there's something that's gonna happen here after verse 19 from verse 20 all the way down to 18 and verse 14, Jesus is going to be engaged in doing a lot of teaching with his disciples. 
So if we can skip ahead for the moment, we'll come back to this. We're going to see the people person, Jesus, <laughs> with another group of people in Luke 18, verse 15 through 17, if you wouldn't mind reading that. It says, Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. All right, so a completely different group than the sick. And here we have babies being brought to, to Jesus. And um, the disciples don't really quite understand what is going on there, but Jesus is demonstrating to us that young people are important to him, that he values them. And in the first century, they may not have been a, a group that on the whole society gave much attention to or gave much legitimacy to. But Jesus takes this opportunity to praise them and to say that he cares about young people. He says, let the children come to me, allow them to do this. It's a good and a right thing to do. In Matthew 19, 13 through 14, he's gonna say a similar thing, that they're of the kingdom. And in Matthew 18, three through four, if we don't humble ourselves and become like little children, there's no chance for us to inherit the kingdom. So whereas in the ancient world, children might have been a nuisance or maybe just hired hands to go out and do work, in Jesus' mind, they were a prized possession, a picture of humility, people worth his time and attention, and people that weren't disrupting his work. The apostles probably meant no harm, but when they rebuked these children, they're saying, hey, Jesus has more important things to do. It's time to get serious about the mission and about the kingdom. But Jesus stops them in their tracks to say, Children are not an interruption to kingdom business. Mm -hmm. They're a part of what the kingdom's all about. They're precious souls. They are the future of this world, the future of the kingdom. And so let's think about what we can do day by day in the church setting. After church services, we can reach out to them and pay attention to them and say, I, I heard you singing. That mm -hmm. was beautiful. Or after a young man uh, participates in some activity, we hear at a pew packers class or something say, you know, you're going to be a preacher someday or, or encourage them and say, I saw that good thing that you did. There's so much there. We'll just pay attention like Jesus did to those good qualities that young people have. And when we do that, we're following in the footsteps of Jesus and even of the Holy Spirit of God himself. You think about how many times in the Bible young people are mentioned, even in incidental ways. And so in John 6, the young boy with the bag lunch and he provides it to Andrew so that Jesus might feed the multitude. I don't know if that happens if that's not a young man that does that on that occasion. Or Paul's nephew in Acts chapters 22 through 24 who alerts the Jewish officials that there are some individuals who want to kill Paul. Excuse me, he alerts the Roman officials that the right. Jews want to kill Paul. A young person is capable of doing that great thing. And so they can provide many great things of service and pictures of innocence and dedication and devotion. But here's what we do know. They weren't overlooked by Jesus, and we shouldn't overlook them either. That's right. If Jesus, or further, God put kings on the throne at such mm -hmm. a young age, we know that it's on the throne of God's heart. And Jesus demonstrates that by how important they were. Jesus tells us it's all about sick people. It's all about young people. And then we have this dramatic follow-up in contrast uh, that may surprise us when he shows us that it's all about unreceptive people. If you didn't mind reading verse 18 through 25, We'll see that next incident. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so to say again that it's all about unreceptive people, perhaps our first reaction, certainly the first reaction of the disciples would be, you're saying this guy is unreceptive? And you really don't have that indication up front when you see all the good things that he could legitimately apparently say about himself, that from his youth up he had kept all these commandments of God. He comes to Jesus, so he's going in the right place. He's seeking out answers from the right individual. And in doing that, he's a good moral person and so 
this is a reminder to us, we don't always know who is and who is not receptive. We're we're aware that there's several soil types earlier in Luke, Luke 8, 11 through 15, but we can't see who is and who isn't that good soil. I think one of our problems is we don't want to waste our time. We would like right. to be able to just go out and e examine hearts with our eyes and pick out who would be interested and who we think would make a good candidate for the gospel and who wouldn't. But the reality is we just can't know that with the naked human eye. We have to engage people and interact with people, and only then can we discover, because sometimes we'll be surprised with who's receptive and who isn't. And so unreceptive people are people that we should be engaged with and concerned about because we just never know. Well, this young man seems to have everything together, right? Financially, uh, socially, and maybe even spiritually. And so it took Jesus probing deeper into his life to determine where he was. Jesus looks at his life and Jesus sees what he's really all about. You think about on the flip side of that, there are people that Jesus encounters who you wouldn't think would be receptive, but they ultimately turn around and they are receptive to the gospel. This is an example of sometimes we misread people, we misjudge, and that's because we're human beings. First Samuel 16 and verse seven says, man looks on the outward appearance, but God, he looks at the heart. That's right, and I think Jesus then gives us some great principles in our interactions mm -hmm. with the people who may not be receptive to the gospel. That the unreceptive may look like a good s soil, uh, it may not be, but the unreceptive are those who are fighting a formidable foe. It's the same foe that we're all fighting. You know, Peter calls him a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And that foe is one that we let in ourselves. James says we're not to say that God's the cause of temptation, but we're drawn away of our own lust and enticed. And this young man, as great as he was, was otherwise, was fighting a battle that he allowed to be too great, too great for God to help. So we shouldn't be discouraged when we run into people who are fighting a foe and they're losing that fight. That's right, and this, <clears throat> the issue the young man faced was he was trusting in something else and waiting, wanting something else to be his ultimate deliverer and to help him. And throughout the Gospel of Luke, Luke mentions individuals who might have other priorities outside of kingdom matters that make them uneligible candidates. Not that God doesn't want to save them, but they're not interested enough in those spiritual things to let it lead to their redemption. In Luke 9, 57 through 62, there's those individuals who want to follow Jesus initially, but when they hear what that involves, they turn away with disinterest. And so the rich young ruler, as he's sometimes been called, looks like an individual who has all the right characteristics, who has the right spiritual resume, but in the end, he's unreceptive and really unresponsive to Jesus in a positive light. That's right. You know, Mark reminds us that Jesus loved him. Hmm. He, and so he's going to put in the time. Again, Jesus knows ultimately he's going to walk away. He's going to be grieved because of his property and his wealth. But Jesus gave him his time. And it's a reminder to us that ultimately we may have to just shake the dust from our feet, but we want to give the unreceptive people our time and our efforts because Jesus would. That's right. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that we're not to give that which is holy unto dogs or cast pearls before swine lest they trample them under their feet and turn and rend us to pieces. And so we don't want to waste time, but that's only after we've invested with people that we can say, you know what, this person's no longer interested. We want to go in another way. But when we plant the seed, not knowing what will happen in the days and weeks and years to come, we're never wasting our time when we do that. As you mentioned, the time may come where we have to shake the dust off our feet, but until then, our feet should be firmly planted and in the direction of even unreceptive people. You think about Jesus with the young people, that's not really a struggle as much. You think about Jesus with sick people, his ability to heal, his concern for the afflicted, but unreceptive people, that may challenge us and push us outside of our comfort zone, but Jesus was even concerned about them. That's right. And I think there's another category of people that really challenge us to our dedication because they can be an emotional uh, time drain. It can be a high maintenance issue, we may say. But Jesus, our example, is going to spend his time with someone else that is um, a difficult person, but it's a people person that Jesus was. He's going to spend time with them. And he shows us that it's all about struggling people. If you continue reading there in verse 35, there's this great contrast that Jesus gives in another category of folks. Verse 35 begins, As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging, and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, and he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people. When they saw it, they gave praise to God. So Luke gives us Bartimaeus. Hmm. On, Jesus is on his way into Jericho. And in this beggar, we have probably the, the greatest struggler in the Gospels. I mean, at least in the variety of ways. He's a beggar, and so he's struggling financially. You know, he's not exactly in the in crowd, so he's, he's kind of struggling in the social sense. He uh, is blind, and so he's got physical issues. And Jesus talks to him about his sins, and so he's struggling spiritually. You know, you and I, all of us who are trying to serve Christ, are going to encounter people who are struggling in some mighty ways against some great enemies that may be in these variety of ways that we've talked about. You know, people try to silence this man. He's struggling. He's crying out for help. People try to sil silence this man, but he cries out all the more. And then Jesus does come to his assistance. So we see Jesus with struggling people. And what we see Jesus doing, we need to try to mimic his behavior. What do we learn from this encounter that we need to incorporate in our lives as we encounter various people that are struggling? We certainly don't want to be like the people that were trying to hush this man and push him further into the darkness or in a back alley somewhere. What do we need to do on the positive end? Well, we remind ourselves that people search for God when they're struggling. And it'd be nice if we always turned to God even when things were going great or that people would search for God when everything was, was falling out in their direction. But sometimes it takes a struggle. You know, my dad used to say that sometimes people have to fall flat on their back to look up and see God. Hmm. And that's Bartimaeus. He is he's struggling and when he struggled he searched. People may not come to the Lord except for some trial that comes into their life. And it can be a blessing if we're there to see those struggling people. You think about all the people that came to Jesus when they were hurting. You think about the big name, Saul of Tarsus, and when he was knocked down, he finally looked up and saw the Lord. But also in Luke, in Luke 15, 1 and 2, it says, Then drew near all the publicans and sinners to hear Jesus. And as they were at their spiritual rock bottom, they turned to Jesus, and Jesus taught them and received them and was even willing to forgive them. But what else do we learn from Jesus' encounter with Bartimaeus? Well, in verse 39, we see that those who are struggling are in need of mercy. Now this is certainly about them, but this is also about us. How do we treat people who are struggling, who are at their lowest? What is it that they need? They, they may be rough around the edges, they may be kind of a porcupine, and it may not be easy for us, but we need to look past that, as Jesus did, and to see the struggles that are going on. They, they need us, they are in need of mercy, and they may not get it from anywhere else, but we have an opportunity to reflect Jesus by showing them that. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. If we know we stand in need of mercy, we need to be constantly extending it to others. And mercy is this goodness and benevolence toward the afflicted join with the desire to help. We see people in need and we help them. Someone's described mercy this way. It's like seeing a dog trapped between a barbed wire fence and you go in on the backside and try to gently pull the dog out. You see him hurting and struggling and scratching himself in his back as he's trying to make his way out and you go to relieve the burden. And being merciful toward other people is kind of like that. We have goodness and kindness toward the afflicted and we go in and help where we can. That's right. You know, and akin to that, we see that the struggling need what only Christ can provide. Now, Christ is physically present here in verse 40, and he gives Bartimaeus his sight. But we need to remind ourselves that as they're struggling, whatever else they need, if it's financial, if it's social, if it's physical, they ultimately, at the end of the day, need what only Christ can give them. And God may have you and I in the gap to be the one that provides that for them. This was true in Jesus' earthly ministry, and it confused people. Mm -hmm. In Mark chapter 2, they let the paralytic down on the bed. The four friends bring him in, and the first thing Jesus says to the man is, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, part of the reason why Jesus does that as we work our way through the chapter is to show that he's divine and that he could forgive sins. And eventually, he tells the man to take up his bed and walk as he silences the Pharisees. But another part of that shows priorities in the mind of Jesus, and he knew what that man needed more than he needed his legs to walk was he needed his forgiveness that he could extend. He needed Jesus' forgiveness, his sins cleansed, and that's what Jesus provides for him first. More than anything else, hurting people need their 
lives restored and their spiritual standing with God made right and reconciliation is at the top of everybody's spiritual priority list, whether or not we acknowledge it. That's right. And that leads right into where we would kind of end this little slice of scripture. Uh, and that is that it's all about lost people. Um, Zacchaeus doesn't have the physical mm. impediments that Bartimaeus does, but in Luke 19, 1 through 10, perhaps one of the more familiar stories in the book of Luke is this tax collector who'd been cheating people, but who knows that Jesus is around uh, there in Jericho, and he climbs up in that sycamore tree so that he can see and, and hear Jesus. And he's so touched by Jesus and his ministry that he invites Jesus into his home, and as a result of that, he has a change of heart. Uh, and he's going to restore you know, even more than what he has taken. And Jesus says, this son of Abraham is why he had come. And he said, for the son of man has come to seek and to save what's lost. I think this is important. We read in the New Testament, especially in the gospels about tax collectors, and maybe we don't have the right view of tax collectors as the New Testament points out. Mm -hmm. These people didn't work at H&R Block or something like that. Tax collectors, according to scripture, were corrupt people sometimes that took from their Jewish countrymen even double and they worked for the Romans and so, what do we learn from Jesus as he encounters this tax collector on how we ought to treat people that are in sin? We need to remind ourselves that lost people are often people who have an unsavory lifestyle. Like you say, a marginalized person who was ostracized by uh, his peers, you know, they, he needed the gospel and they often are coming that package. What else do we see Jesus is saying? They have unsavory lifestyles. They may not be welcomed by other people. They may have some rough around the edges, but what else do we see about people that are lost? Well, lost people sometimes can't see Jesus because of the crowd. Uh, commend Zacchaeus for getting up in the tree, but we need to remember that we need to find these folks who are looking for Jesus. So he gets to a point where he can see Jesus clearly and then he's able to encounter him and that changes his life as he gets a clear picture of who Jesus is. Anything else from Luke 19? Well, Jesus could see potential in him, whereas the Pharisees and others didn't. We need to remember that to see like Jesus, we need to see people having those potentials, that has that potential. In between all of this, Jesus is dealing with the disciples, and he tells us that it's all about the Lord's people. And he teaches them about the future, about how to handle differences that they have, uh, how to resolve the sin problems in their life. And he shows us that he spends a lot of time in between all of this with his disciples. And it's a reminder to us that we need to engage ourselves with the people of God as well. You know, some people are going to treat us better than we deserve. Some people are going to treat us worse than we think that they should. But of all of the joys of living the Christian life, none is more thrilling than to have the opportunity to be involved in the lives of people. So whether it's those people that are sick, whether it's young people, whether it's uh, people that seem receptive and who are not, whether it's those people that are, are uh, struggling in their lives, if it's those people that are lost, or if it's the Lord's people, it's all about people.